So I just want to thank everybody, and particularly Justin and Josette and everybody here at the CAS for having us here tonight. Yes, thank you very And the Scarborough Wine Company. And just to Alex, I'm going to hand it over to you. You're going to hand it over to me? Okay. Thank you, thank you very much. Good. Okay, I wasn't quite. Um, so again, thank you very much for coming. If I can, I'm just going, I'm going to do a little demonstration later. Um, so I'll kind of let the um, food show you more about how the book works entirely. But uh, just to um, explain to you how I got started with this book, it came and has ended like a sort of an open letter of answers to questions that I've been asked over 15 or 16 years of teaching people how to cook. I never quite ended, um, expected to end up doing what I'm doing, but I was in, um, at the time I was working in Bermuda actually, and I'll be, I remember Block, my old boss, got in touch with me and asked me to come back and take over the cookery school with my market all cat says on. And so I had actually planned to go to Italy and have a year there, but I came back to do that and ended up doing all these sorts of different things. And when I started doing the cookery school at the Memoir, I didn't have any understanding really of how to teach and also what people wanted. So I was just trying to go in and kind of show it off and say, look, I can do this and I can do that. And then I found, you know, through, through the years of people asking me questions and um, finding ways that I could incorporate things that people do in restaurants into home cooking and also taking away the stuff that I felt um, wasn't entirely necessary. And then before I did this, I sent out um, emails to about two or three hundred people and um, asked them what they you know, really wanted in a cookbook. And interestingly, think that this, is, this is just something, 95% of people, the most important thing for them was to have a photograph of the finished dish. Yes. And so there is a photograph of every finished dish and, um, and in there. But what I want to, um, more than that, from this cookbook is to not just tell people it was simple and tell them to get on with it. I was wanting to tell them that it can be simple enough and here are the tools for you to help it become simple. And for me, um, Really, in lots of ways, the main thing is just to get everything ready before you start so you don't have to look for everything while you're cooking. And so I took things like that throughout it, but then it kind of developed and grew because originally this was going to be three books. But my commissioning editor very cleverly said, no, no, we'll turn it into one. <laughs> so um, the first section basically goes with the adventures with ingredients. So this is the thing. I wanted to find six ingredients, and I did, that were very easy to get hold of and were very easily adaptable. And this was massively important because the thing that you are, that often um, I don't think has gotten across strongly enough in teaching people how to cook, but learning how to cook, is it's just like anything else. You need to do the same thing a lot of times. But of course you don't want to eat the same thing exactly a lot of times. So it was about making these little changes each time, changes in seasoning. And also I have a bit at the beginning when I talk about the importance of seasoning. And how, you know, we always just reach for salt and pepper. So like salt and pepper. But of course you can do something, like say you're just cooking a piece of salmon or a piece of chicken. Why not salt and curry powder? Why not salt and five spice? Salt and cayenne pepper? Salt and smoked paprika? And it's just... Um, if people don't cook that often, they're not, it's finding that once you get a little success like that and then getting that confidence and that sort of confidence to carry on. And so I took that through one section and the second section is the one that's been with me for the longest and it's called the Magic Fridge. Now that came about when I had the cooking school in the south of France. And the first night um, we discovered that the best way to get people sort of interacting was to do a buffet. So instead of doing a sit-down dinner, we had this great sort of Provencal spread that we put out with Pissada Dier and Salad Soirs and all sorts of wonderful things. And they would get chatting, but of course with the buffet you have lots of stuff left over. So I had this fridge behind me when I was demonstrating. I had bits of roasted peppers, bits of pesto, bits of tapenade, uh, bits of all sorts of bits of salad soirs actually that would turn into a pain bun And I used to call it my magic fridge, because someone would say, what about we do this? And because their time was very loose at Provence, we never really had to go with any sort of rules. And I would just grab things from it. So that has gone and developed now for over sort of 12 years. And the last one, in a way, because see, I um, always joke, I was brought up during the war, you see, so I hate to throw things away. I, I really can't stand it. And what I wanted to do was to find a way of... Um, of, of, of what's that? Which war? I was the, the first Gulf War. <laughs> so, yeah, and, um, but anyway, um, you know, people talk about, um, oh God, I've got this leftover in the fridge. Now, I love leftovers. I've got a real thing. I just absolutely love leftovers. And the other thing where this chapter came from was my um, wife's grandfather, he was on his own after his wife died for about 10 years and he loved things like roast chicken and he loved a braised shoulder of lamb was another thing that he really loved but he'd never do them for himself because he just had too much left over. So what I want to do is find things that could freeze for one thing and then I want to find really quite glamorous ways of using them up and so the way that I talk about rather than having leftovers you just needed to start off with a cooked something whether it be mackerel, whether it be lentils, roast chicken, whether it be um, oh, what else is there, some duck, some lamb and um, and the other thing about that was I love gravy. I love gravy. I love, love, love gravy. So everything in there has about twice as much gravy as it needs. Uh, because there's the great sort of, um, because there's two real things about that. If you can have lots of gravy left over, you take a, a thick slice of bread and you butter it, and then you sprinkle it with the crunchy salt, 
I flew over to sell all of them. Some bad pink. Someone brought me that pink salt. Yeah, that's that, pink that's salt. so good too. Yeah, something like that. And then you soak it in the gravy. It's so good. It's just too good. Um, and or of course you could you could use it. But there's always lots and lots of gravy in my recipes with that. And whether it be anything or the gravy or the sauce that it goes with. And so and then I just want it all to be main courses. So there's no starters and no puddings. There's just the stuff that you could possibly do every day. And with the thing of having the recipes for two, of course, much easier to divide by two for one. I mean, that's just terrible, but you know what I mean. <laughs> to turn it to one, or to turn it to four, to turn it to six, you know, much easier than going from four. Because the other thing that, I mean, I've got a young family. We never cook for four. We cook for three. And then I suppose when they're teenagers, we're probably cooking for about 17. <laughs> so it's, um, you know, it's very rare that you actually cook for four people. I suppose if you, are, you know, sort of do that kind of couples thing. But I'm not sure how that works here, but anyway. Um, <laughs> And that's it really. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to hand you over to Justin then and then um, give you, we're going to give you some more food and some more wine and then I'm going to do a little demonstration and then I'm going to show up. <laughs> <laughs> no, really? That's